God had never had a chance to prove that there was no better way to live and love. And so he's about to show not just the fact that he is powerful, but he's about to show that he is good and gracious and merciful. And he gives those who thought they could do better than him sovereignty. And he said, you can go and you can be the prince of this earth and prince of this world. He's not talk- I'm not talking about us right now. I'm talking about the angelic realm, the, the, Satan and the fallen angels. And God warned the men that he created in his image that there is a liar there. And all you need to know is that I'm good and he's not. He's not uh, in and of himself sovereign. He's not in and of himself powerful. And he is not good. And he is a liar. All you need to know, man, is that I'm good. You need to be related to me and walk with me and it will be glorious. But the day that you think that there's a better way, the day that you think you can find life apart from me, you will bring the same chaos and darkness and disorder into your life. And that's exactly what we did. And as you find God's record of human history's de-evolution, back not towards apes, but towards sinners, away from the glory that God intended for us, you see chaos and destruction and death and war ensue. And what God did in the midst of that chaos is he ran to it. And he's a rescuer, and he's a lover, and he by no means will let the guilty go unpunished, but he is patient towards you, not wishing for any man or woman or child that suffers because of the sin of man to perish, but that all would come to eternal life. And so he rescues humanity, and then he asks for some men to walk with him, and his glory is restored, and his grace is found to be a source of that glory and grace to others. The very first thing that men do made in the image of God is they step up and they play the man. Whenever I see men that do this, it strengthens my heart. One of my favorite stories of all time uh, happened in uh, 1555 in England. This is um, uh, several decades after a guy named Martin Luther stood up in the face of men that weren't glorious, that perverted the word of God, that distorted the word of God, that began to use this book to oppress and abuse people. That's what always happens when men create systems. Uh, Dead religion is always there to control people, not set people free. And the Pope and his minions were controlling people. It was said um, of the Bishop of Germany, uh, one of the servants of the Pope during that day and age in the 16th century, that if it weren't for this man that stood up, Martin Luther, and taught people what God said, that he intended for them to be free, we could have made all of Germany to eat hay. What he meant by that was, we could tell people that we hold the keys to the kingdom, the keys to heaven. And these men, these superstitious individuals that believe we're the the vice roys of God, that we are the ones that represent God's will and way, that if we tell them they gotta eat hay to get to heaven, we could have made them eat hay. And then all of a sudden, what Luther did is he came along and he took the scriptures and he starts to teach it, not in Latin, which no one knew, but make it available in common German and make it available to people that they may know what the word of God says. That you don't earn your way to him, that God has been running to your chaos and your sin. That Jesus didn't come to die so that if you did other things, you would eventually be forgiven by God, but Jesus came to set you free and to restore you back into relationship with your father so you could be the man that God wants you to be. And he took away the death grip of superstition and error that was contained in the church of Rome. And a fire swept across um, the known world at the time. Five years later, it hit England. And it was no small controversy there. There was a, a king that was there Um, who was uh, wanting to uh, get rid of one of his wives and start over with another one. And there was a bunch of corruption that happened where basically uh, he bought his way out of his marriage in, um, in, in a perversion of Scripture's intent. And uh, he was told that he could move on and he could have another woman and his previous marriage would be annulled. And men started to speak up and go, that's not the way men should act. But there was an unholy alliance that was made with the Church of Rome, and uh, Henry VIII started his parade 
of wives. And there were men that started to speak up and say, listen, not just because that man who is king, who says that he wants to do this, can buy his permission to do these things, do we speak against it, but because all of the corruption that's coming out of this particular expression of the church of God needs to be corrected. And there was a gentleman by the name of Hugh Latimer that ran into a student. This man was a, uh, Hugh Latimer was a, a godly man and a godly leader, uh, a servant of the Pope at Cambridge. And there was a young student that came to him that uh, his name Thomas Bilney that started to say, hey, uh, Pastor Latimer, Father Latimer, I have found truth that will set me free. And he asked if he could come and meet with him. This student to this esteemed Cambridge uh, officer and teacher and servant of one of the most powerful institutions on earth, this student went in there and this student had been known of following the teachings of Luther and actually following the teachings of the New Testament because he was reading his Greek New Testament and he saw that what Luther said was true. And so he went in and uh, he said, I need to speak with you, Professor. The professor thought he was going to recant and seek forgiveness for causing trouble at Cambridge. And he ended up sharing a testimony that converted this 35-year-old leader in the church. And for the next decades, that Cambridge professor and this leader in the church of Rome became a vigilant spokesperson for truth and freedom. When he was 62, he was locked up in the Tower of London. Uh, he'd be summoned out every now and then to go before uh, different church um, councils that would ask him to recant because he was a powerful speaker. And it, every single time, all he would bring is a simple New Testament and defend his position from the Scriptures. And then one day, they said, it's enough of the debate, and they took him and uh, another young church leader by the name of Nicholas Ridley, and they brought him there in the square, and they tied him with a chain to a post, and they were gonna light him on fire, and they knew it was their death. And they were being burned because they were gonna be truthful and rightful representations of the grace of God. Lattimore and Ridley. And I love this section of history because at this moment, um, men that were there wrote down what uh, Hugh Latimer said to Nicholas Ridley at that moment, right before they were burned, and he said this. He said, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. Because we shall this day light a candle, such a candle of God's grace in all of England that I trust it shall never be put out. And they lit that flame, and those two men singing hymns went home to be with their king. And they died for the truth that set men free. And uh, we, we know that that candle in England still exists. Even though it's gotten dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because other men have not followed in their way. They've moved back towards dead religion, even within the Reformed Protestant church. May it never be. Here's a picture of that spot. They marked the spot where Ridley and Latimer, I think there's a wider shot even that you can go back and you can see. This is in the common place in the middle of a, a busy street in England, but they preserved the land where Latimer and Ridley stood and stepped up and said, we are not going to let wolves dominate you and intimidate you and make you eat hay and be a part of dead religion. And there's a plaque there that marks these men. And it says, this is what happened here on this day. When men step up and do what they should do, other men take note and they mark it and they go, these are men that brought freedom to others because they said, I am going to assume it's my job and my moment. I'm going to take responsibility and I'm going to do what men do. When it says in the scripture to play the man, I love this. In 2 um, Samuel, in chapter 10, this is where Lattimore um, took this verse when he told young Ridley to play the man. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 7, this is David, and he's uh, talking to Joab and all his army and all his mighty men that followed him. And remember, what David was doing is stepping up. He's eradicating chaos and evil and oppression in the land. He's not yet king, but he's, um, he's, he's at a place where he is um, doing what men do which is to deal with wolves and oppression that are in the land. And he takes Joab, the leader of the army, and his mighty men, and then he says in verse 12, he says this. He says, be strong and let us show ourselves 
courageous right there in verse 12, for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And let the, door, let the Lord do what seems right to him in 2 Samuel 10, 12. Now in, in, um, in King James, in the original language, it doesn't say, let us take courage. It says specifically this, let us be good, of good courage. This is the Bible that Lattimore had. Let us be of good courage, Joab and mighty men, and let us play the men for our people. What's it mean to play the man? It means to take courage, to have a strong heart, a heart that is informed by truth. It means to be living the way that God would want you to live. Now I'm gonna show you a little excerpt right here, and I'm gonna tell you this is the way men who understand what God wants them to do. First, I'm gonna put up a definition for this very first week. Men step up, they play the man. This is what men do, and you can write these words down if they're not in your book, I think they are. Lead, men lead, they don't follow, they don't shrink back. They step up and they initiate. They are men of action. They say, let us take courage and do what we should do. They assume every man that's made in the image of God will assume it is his job and it's his moment. This is it for you. I've told you guys again and again, I know what I'm gonna ask God to do when I see him. And I see that everything that he said about who he was is true. I'm going to want to say, now that I'm fully convinced because I see you and I don't see with the eyes of faith, I see with the eyes of, of reality that every man will see with fully one day. I'm gonna beg for the privilege to go back and act like a man. In other words, I'm living today in the answer to the one prayer I'm gonna ask God when I meet him. Let me go serve you, O king. Let me be a man. Let me do what you want me to do. Let me take my moment and use it for your glory. Let me hate apathy and reject passivity. Let me play the man. Let me rescue the weak. Let me stand against the oppressor. Let me strangle the wolf. Let me be filled with tender mercy and love. And there's a scene from a movie that uh, has some rough things in it, but there are pieces of it that have enough redemptive value that I have watched it and I commend it to you on VidAngel if you can handle it. And here's a little clip. This is the American Sniper movie. This is uh, the very beginning of the movie and it's showing you where this, this warrior came from, what kind of home produced this warrior called Chris Kyle, who rightly, as a minister of God's justice, which is what God says the army is, not individual men acting as vigilantes, all right, God tells men how to act who aren't a part of a sovereign government. But when you're a part of a sovereign government and you're a minister of God for good, the scripture says, you don't bear the sword for nothing. And there's a time to go to war and to deal with evil that is systematic and, um, and, and intentional. And so nations go to war, just like they did in 2 Samuel 10. They should today. Uh, go catch the little series I did. It's called War, What's It Good For? But um, here's a little clip, and it helps us understand who we are. Watch this. Now, I want to show you something. This is our website. We are one church with four campuses and thousands of locations, and I've asked them to change that. You can actually use the front. Do you have that one church? Yeah, there's four campuses, thousands of locations. I've changed that, and this is what it says now. And we will whoop your ass <laughs> if you are whooped. Now listen, I think there's three kinds of men that are godly men. There are sheep who know our master's voice, that know Jesus is their shepherd, and because by the kindness of God, we begin to walk with him as he intends us to walk with him as sheep who have a good shepherd, we are his sheepdogs. And I'm going to say this, and I mean this, I don't want to just get a cheap laugh. But part of what we do because we are men is when we see men who become wolves and not sheepdogs is we will confront you. And we will step up and we will say, that's not the way men act. That's not the what you do, single man, with a single woman. That's not the way you date. That's not the way you use your wealth. That's not the way you use your power. And we will speak the truth to one another. And there's a lot of guys who don't like that. And they'll want to burn you at the stake and they will go to war with you, and they hate you because they are of their father who is himself a wolf. 
In fact, he is a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour. Godly men run to the chaos. That's what God did. Men who are weak hide in the darkness and they live in the shadows because they want to do what they want to do and they don't want their deeds to be exposed in the light. They want to they want to say they'll love a woman and leave her. They want to stay married to a woman and be abusive towards her. And we should whoop their way of living with truth and modeling righteousness in what real men are. Here's pictures of what happened at 9-11. You see all kinds of folks when that chaos first ensued, and you'll notice which direction they are running from the cloud. You'll see it again and again. Here's this last picture, which is especially tragic because you see people that are supposed to run towards trouble running from it. But this is what men do that are made in the image of God. They run towards chaos and darkness and pain and suffering, and they lead, they initiate, they are men of action. They assume it's their job and their moment. They hate apathy and they reject passivity because they are God's men. And if they see wolves, they kick their hiney. God did this. We're made in his image. Remember that? In John chapter 18, you have a section of scripture right here where Pilate is hanging out with Jesus um, <coughs> because uh, wolves hated him because he, like Luther years later and Latimer years later, uh, was speaking out against the oppression of men. I'm going to read this section quickly. Pilate, when he was with Jesus and he understood that he had this man thrown upon him that others hated, um, Pilate said, who are you and what's up with you? You know, I'm not a Jew. I don't know why you're here and the Jews hate you. Your own nation and your chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Mark my word, man. If you step up, if you lead, if you initiate, if you hate apathy and reject passivity, others will hate you. Others that call themselves men will hate you. Because you're going to be calling, you're going to bring light into their darkness. And Pilate's saying, what's up with you? Jesus answered, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And men, this is not your kingdom. You are aliens and strangers. You are at war. And the enemy will hate you. And you will have to stand firm and be on the alert and be strong and act like men. And when you fight, you fight by um, taking down um, thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And you let everything you do be done in love. But you are men. And this is not your home. And so quit looking for ease and comfort. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life in order that he might please the one that enlists him as a soldier. We are at war. And we need to stand firm and shod our feet in the gospel of Christ, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and pick up the sword of the Spirit. And again, I, I'll, just, I'll use the phrase, we'll whoop the wolf's ass with truth. That is, it's not a power encounter, it's a truth encounter. And you want to burn me at the stake? Well, then we will light, by God's grace, such a candle that it will never go out. And men will mark the spot. Here were men, and they loved when every other man didn't love. Here were men that were faithful when every other man became unfaithful. Here are men that kept their pants up. Here were men that made women glad they were women with those men. Children that respected those fathers because they weren't about their own hobbies and habits. But this isn't your home. It's not my home. Pilate said to him, so you're a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. Jesus knew exactly who he was, and you must too. For this I've been born, and for this I've come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Sheep, do you hear his voice? Is this your shepherd? Watch it. Pilate said to him, what's truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to him, I find no guilt in him, but, but you have a custom that I should release. Now this coward of a man, Pilate, is trying to find a way to, to, to not call an innocent man guilty and still not offend the people. And they cried out again, no, we don't want him. We want this murderous Barabbas that was um, somebody that they had initially uh, been glad that Rome had captured because he was creating oppression to the people that he said he was there to set free, which is what men who, who are doing what's right in their own eyes always do. And it says, at that point, Pilate took Jesus and he beat him, thinking maybe that would satisfy him. 
satisfy the crowds. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up and say to him, Hail the king of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Echi homo, in Latin. Behold the man. Guys, this is who the picture of what a man is. It's Jesus. There is no question he was strong. John chapter 10 talks about what a sheepdog, what a shepherd does. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If your wife, if your kids don't go, hey, tell me about your dad, and they go, I'll tell you about my dad. He is not about him. If your girlfriend's single man go, I'll tell you about my boyfriend, he's not about him. He's not telling me if I love him, he'll let me do this. He's not experimenting with me like I'm his wife. If your kids don't say, my dad is not about him, then you are not like the one whom you say you love. If you're not rescuing them from the darkness and the chaos, if you're not saying no to your flesh because you're not about you, if you're surrendering your flesh, you're not the man that God intended you to be. And praise God that this Jesus went to the cross for us to redeem us. But we've got to take seriously that redemption and begin to walk in it. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's not about himself. The one who's a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he runs from the chaos. He leaves the sheep and flees. He goes about his little golf game. He goes about his little comfort. He goes about his little pornography. He goes about his little mistress. He goes about a little business that's all about him. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's not God's man and the glory is not on him. That's not what men do. They lead. They initiate. They walk back into a dysfunctional marriage and say, I'm going to own my stuff. I'm going to be a man of action. I'm not going to make this about you. This is about me. It's my job and my moment to restore what my sin has destroyed. And they hate apathy. And they reject passivity. They are on the alert. They are firm in the faith. Quickly, I could walk all day. In fact, I thought about just spending our entire first week on this little section right here in Psalm 101. Psalm 101, I called it the King Psalm. I've called it that for a long time. It was the very first thing I had my kids memorize in Scripture. And Psalm 101, it turns out, is a psalm that for years had been called the Princess Psalm because uh, it was written by a young David. And what you're going to find out is that David, before he became somebody who went out and oppressed evil, and said, if I find wolves, I'm going to kick their ass. And I'm going to say it again. This is a very biblical idea. God hates those who destroy people. And he wants to rescue them from their destruction before it's time and judgment. But mark my word, he will not put up with their evil law. And um, David, in this king's psalm, um, describes what a king does. This is, in a sense, his inaugural address. It's when he stood up and he had been affirmed king, and he said, this is the way my king's going to roll. And it is a psalm that talks about how you need to think. And what marks this psalm um, eight or nine or ten different times, depending if you use I shalls along with I wills, is David says, I will, I will, I will, I will. And he makes it really clear that he's going to be a man of action and a man of purpose. And he's going to say, this is what you can know about me. This is my moment. And this is your king. And what David does is he says, I'm going to look at the reign of God. I'm going to look at the character of God. And I will sing of the goodness of God. I will remind myself of who God is. And I will be his man. And every time that David did that, it led to blessing in the land. Now this psalm ends with him saying, I will find wolves and I will kick their butt. 
And what happened is David stopped doing Psalm 101 during a season, and he didn't kick butt. He started looking at butt. And it got him in trouble. But for years, there was a righteous king. Now watch this. You want to know what to do? Memorize Psalm 101. Step up and make these I wills the way that you live. He starts by saying this. He says, um, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. I'll remind myself what is right and true. It's so interesting. When you look at who Jesus is, we beheld the glory of God in the person of Jesus, and we saw that he was full of grace and truth. That's who he is. God is the God of strength and justice and mercy and love. That's what men are. They are tender warriors. They are shepherd kings. And David said, I'm going to remind myself why I'm so glad to have Jesus, God, if you will, as my good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He is loving kindness. He is mercy. And I will tell everybody I can about him with my lips and with my life. Now, what David does in this little psalm right here is he sets himself up and he does and walks through and he basically says in verses one through three, I will, he gives you a bunch of different ways to say it, but this is what he says, I will lead, but watch what he says he's gonna lead. I will lead myself. And men, that's the very first thing you gotta do. We cannot go and tell others about what this country should be like or their family should be like or their lives should be like if we are not men of self-leadership. The precious possession of a man is diligence. What men do is we think we're great because we look good in a mirror. And God says you're great if you reflect my glory and you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And David says, I'm going to remind myself of the loving kindness and justice of God. I will use my lips and I will use my life. You want to know what my kingship's going to be about? Modeling God. Now, I want you to think about this. You go, well, I'm not a king, Todd. Yes, you are. You're the king in your home. Now, you're not sovereign over it. God is. But he's going to let people suffer under your leadership or prosper. Young princes, you are free to make your choices, but you're not free to choose your consequences. And I want to ask you, single men, are you marked by loving kindness and justice or perversion and self-indulgence? Is there chaos where you have dated, or do you leave women better than you find them? Don't tell me about how others should do and lead if you're not leading yourself. David starts by saying, I'm going to follow the greatest leader, the shepherd king. And so watch. He says, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. And then he goes through and he says all these different things about what he's going to do. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me, God? I'm ready for you. I'm not going to shrink back. Because I live as if I know that you will come and your recompense and your reward is with you and I will be ready. I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. What David's just saying right here is I'm going to be about self-leadership. Before I speak about righteousness to the nation, I will model righteousness before them. I will not be a do as I say, not do as I do leader. I will be a follow me. I will be an imitate me as I imitate Christ or God kind of man. The king will go first in righteousness and not act above the law. It was a major shift in world history when we said it is no longer going to be Rex Lex. Rex means king, Lex means law. It's no longer going to be the king is law. It's going to be Lex Rex. The law is king, and the king himself is subject to law and righteousness. David said, I will be a man who will humble myself under the righteousness of God. David said, there's going to be no difference in my behavior, either in the public square or the private palace. I will lead myself. Guys, who you are when you're alone is alone who you are. Now you think about what most guys, and this is what's like, when you think about like music videos and, um, and, and um, rock star lifestyle, what do you think about? Like, man, I want to be rich and famous and powerful. Why? Because I see what the rich, famous, and powerful guys get to do. Whatever they want with women. But David's saying, when I come to ultimate power, it's not going to be time for me to indulge and live the life. I will live a righteous life. When he said, I become powerful, it's not going to be time to party and feed my flesh. He said, I will live a righteous life. When he became in power, he didn't say, it's time for the world to know who the man is. He said, I will be God's man. I will live a righteous life. 
When he became a leader and a king, and he says, it's time for me to oppress those who didn't vote for me. He said, I will behave wisely. That's what David says right here. Verse three, I'll set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. Guys, can you say that? You need to put that on your iPhone. Next time you want to watch something on TV, ask yourself, is this worthless or is it worth something that God said will edify me and build me? And then in verse 4, he's going to move from leading himself. He's going to say, I will be led by wise and faithful men. Guys, when you step up, not only do you lead yourself, but then you lead yourself in who you run with. Now watch what he says in verses 4 through 7. There's some more I wills. I will not have a perverse heart be my friend. It shall depart from me. I will know no evil. The guys that slander others, I will destroy them. No one who is a haughty look, who is arrogant and prideful and scoffs and mocks at God, I'm not going to have them be my counselors and my friends. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he meditates day and night. I will be that king. If you're a wicked man, if you're a scoffer, if you're defined by sin, you will not be my playmate. That's not going to be my cabinet, guys who encourage me towards compromise. No, my brothers, verse 6, shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. The one who walks in a blameless way, he will minister to me. How you doing, men? Are you that? Are you that guy who says, you want to walk with a blameless man? Walk with me. You want to walk with somebody who makes war against sin? Walk with me. You want to walk with somebody who, who loves his wife, shepherds his kids, doesn't live for more comfort, who says, I will behave righteously? Walk with me. That's what this church ought to be. That's what God's men are. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood and says that God's way isn't good, his word isn't true, disobeying him is not that big a deal, he shall not maintain his position before me. I will minister to him, but he will not be in the cabinet of my life. David says, I'll lead myself, one through three, verses four through seven, he says, I'll be led by wise and faithful men. And then he says after that in verse 8, then I will kick wolf's ass. And mark my word, guys, you will not be able to kick a wolf's ass if you don't do verses 1 through 7. We don't just get guys who want to go to war and go, you want to go to war? Good, here you go, go to war. No, we train them. We surround them with other men who are trained. They purposely discipline themselves and arm themselves, and they deal with and act wisely in a disciplined way, and that's when the wolf will fall. Verse 8 says it right there before you. Every morning I will destroy the wolves. But i got to deal with a wolf that attacks my heart, one through three. got to be with other guys who hate wolves and aren't wolves in sheep's clothing. I will cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. David says, I will have a right view of God and meditate on his perfection. I will tell others of the goodness of God. I will have a right view of a righteous life. I will look forward to God's coming in nearness. I will walk with integrity. I will avoid sin and temptation. I will hate unrighteousness and the work of those who promote it. I will flee immoral things. That's his inaugural address. And then he says, you want to know who's going to lead with me? I will not give my ear to gossips or prideful and arrogant men. I will walk with wise and faithful men. Righteous men will be my companions. I will avoid mockers and scoffers and those who are comfortable with sin and rebellion. And we, nation, will hunt wolves. We will destroy the arrogant, expose and eradicate the wicked, and we will make ourselves men. And all the people rejoice. When David did that, he kicked ass and took names. When he looked at ass and wanted their names, it brought trouble to the land. And I just say that. I want to just talk to you like men. This is not, listen, man, this is a big deal. Go and look what happens to his family and his nation when he gets selfish and he stopped being that man. Step up, lead, initiate. Be a man of action. Assume it's your job. This is your time, man. Your wife is praying that you don't get up early on Thursday morning. She's praying that the the loving kindness and justice of God runs through your veins. There's a woman out there 
who wants to be courted and dated and loved single men by that kind of man. We have a nation that wants to know, is there going to be man, if they're blessed and educated and prosper, that they're going to be generous? And when the righteous reign, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, there is groaning in the land. Let's go. We don't go to church. We are Christ followers. And this is our moment. And we got to hate apathy. This is not somebody else's job. This is your job. This is your kingdom. This is your moment. I'm going to close with this. I mean, I just, you know, as we now get ready to figure out, okay, what do we got to do to step up? And I'm going to tell you what, if you don't start with thinking how to step up, I think about verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 101 and what you got to do to step up the discipline of godliness in your life. It doesn't matter what else you want to say and do. It's never a glory to a country when they go and beat wicked men and then, and then they, they pay women of the country that they're there to rescue to, to sleep with them and have sex with them. No, that's not the kind of army that God has. There's only one branch of the military that, um, that has never missed its recruiting goals. You know that? That's always had uh, whatever their quota was to fill out this particular wave and season of men that need to be enlist. Uh, there's only one branch of the military that every time has always met its goals. It's the Marines, because the Marines didn't say, come here, fight with us, all right? It just says, we're looking just for a few of the good men. And um, as I was just thinking about uh, this very first thing about stepping up lead and initiating and being a man of action, assuming it's your job and your moment, yeah, only a few men are going to do it. Many a man proclaims his faithfulness, but who can find a trustworthy man, the Scripture says? God's looking for a few good men, and with a few good men, he can change the world. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth, looking for those whose hearts are his, that he might strongly support them. You can do this. If you Psalm 101, 1 through 3, and Psalm 101 with other men, 4 through 7, wolves won't be happy. Women and children will. Watch this little ad. See if you don't see a theme here from the Marines. And then we're done. Watch this. <laughs> look, I'm like, yes. But look, this is not a macho run, you know, to go war and blow people up. Listen, I want to remind you. We run to him and we say, make us like Jesus. And we're the few good men that you're going to use. We're one church, we're four campuses, thousands of locations. And we will not be wolves. We got to deal with wolfness in this camp before we say we're sick of wolves out there. So you figure out where you need to lead yourself this morning, man, what you're going to do about it. You find out the guys that are in your group want to be men like verses 4 through 7 if you can run with them. And you don't sleep in next Thursday. And you don't sleep in between now and then. And some of us need to go home and ask our kingdoms, will you forgive me? Because I have not been a Psalm 101 verses 1 through 7 king. And that's why wolves are destroying this house. And I'm done with that. And I'm going to be God's man. And I'm going to be strong. And I'm going to let everything I do be done in love. And these are the men that are going to help me. And you listen to people sing. And want to know who your God and commander in chief is. And you watch peace prosper in this land. Step up. This is your time and your moment.